Hey everyone, Zach Mason here. Welcome back to the channel. I want to talk a little bit about judgment and the, the concept of judgment of nations. A lot of people uh, don't understand that God judges nations. They think the gospel is only about individuals and our individual response to Christ, that uh, they don't understand that there is a societal level of judgment. There's a net, there's some uh, such a concept in the Bible as national or even global judgment. You see it in in uh, in the flood of Noah, and you see it in the conquest of uh, northern kingdom of Israel and its exile, and then later the the conquest and exile of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah by Babylon, and later the conquest of of the Jewish people by Rome. You know after Christ uh, ascended to heaven. So national judgment is a biblical concept, and it is a biblical concept that's very worthy of study, especially today, given that our country has met all the requirements for being judged by God in a very harsh way. And the question is, you know, you may have is, well, why does God judge? But also on the flip side, why doesn't he judge? In fact, this is these are kind of contradictory questions that atheists often ask Christians uh, as if there's some kind of evidence against the existence of God. You've, I'm sure you've heard people say, hey, if God is all powerful and God is all loving, then why are there bad things happening in the world? Why do bad things happen in the world? And part of the implied in that question is why doesn't God intervene why doesn't he intervene to prevent actions by people that God calls sin in the Bible? Why doesn't he judge sin? Why doesn't he stop it? Why doesn't God act to stop it, is what they're asking. Yet, very quickly after that, same conversation, you can have the same atheist say, if God is so loving then why did he tell Israel to conquer the Canaanites and kill them all? And they don't understand the contradict, they're contradicting themselves. Which is it? Is God's inaction proof he doesn't exist? Or is his action proof he doesn't exist? Which is it? In one hand, you're complaining that he doesn't judge. Then you're complaining when he does judge. So which is it? But for our purposes here in this video, uh, I want to talk about something he was talking about to me this morning. And he just started impressing on me. I was just really paying, I don't know, he, he was highlighting for me the innocence of my, my youngest daughter. Uh, I was in fifth grade. And as I'm dropping her off at school, all of the young kids there with the little backpacks and oh, so cute. And, and he was just really letting me feel his heart for them and just getting into how much God loves kids. God just loves children. He does. And so if you want to think, and I, and I think we could even think about judgment as a simple mathematical formula. Judge, when God judges nations, when does God judge a nation? And when does he not judge a nation? I think basically it comes down to a mathematical formula for him that when he decides that more children will be harmed by not judging than would be harmed if he does judge. Basically, there comes a tipping point where God says, if I judge the people, children will suffer. This many kids will die in that. And of course, they're going to go straight to him. But they won't have had the chance to live out their lives, etc. and receive a lot of blessings that he would want to give them. So if he judges, necessarily some children are going to die. But if he doesn't judge, children are going to die because of us, because of abortion, because we're chopping off the genitalia in hospital, hundreds of hospitals around this country because of unjust wars. Uh, children are gonna be abused sexually and physically. You know, you've got the Epstein network as the high level level, but it's happening among the people. 
So he sees all this and it grieves him. And in fact, let's see some of his heart on this. Uh, Jesus said <clears throat> in Matthew 18, 6, he said, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Implied is, it would be better if that would happen before he would do that meaning that the wrath of a holy God will burn hot against someone who hurts a child in a way that is much worse than actually being killed, drowned in the sea in a way that there's no hope of escaping it, is what Jesus is saying. He's, he's making a radical statement to be clear. He's saying you do not want to harm, harm children. You do not know, you do not understand how much my father loves children. God, he is saying. Um, in another place, we know the story of Jesus receiving the children uh, on his lap, you know, to, to talk to him and listen. And the disciples were rebuking uh, them and, and trying to keep the children away. And um, Jesus got mad. It says, he rebuked the disciples and said, do not keep the children from me. Now, um, there's only two places, the verb there, where it says Jesus got mad, where he rebuked them. The Greek word means he was furious. Jesus wasn't just mildly rebuking them. He was furious with them. There's only one other time in the New Testament where that word is used, and that's when Jesus was enraged and chasing the, the, the sellers out of the temple with a whip. So he loves kids. God loves kids. You can only imagine how angry he is at everything we've done. And we just think life goes on. He hasn't judged us. So it must not be that big a deal to have, for our country to have murdered this many children or done this many things to kids. No, it's just a mathematical formula. He does not want to hurt kids either. So he is measuring what's better. Do I let them keep hurting kids because more would be hurt if I judged? Or has their sin grown to such a level that less children will be hurt if I judge than by letting them continue to do what they do? You know, for example, let's say he made the calculation. If I bring this judgment on the United States, one million children will be harmed. But if I don't bring children, 500 uh, judgment, 500,000 will be harmed. Then he's saying, I will not judge yet. But let's say the calculation changes. And he says, if I continue to let them alone and I don't intervene, two million children are going to be harmed. But if I judge, only one million children will be harmed. Guess which way he's going to go? It's going to flip. Evidence of math being involved in this is Jonah 4. Um, Jonah, if you know the story of Jonah, I'll tell you it real quick. God called him to go to a city called Nineveh, which was the capital of the Assyrian Empire up in southern Turkey, northern Syria today, northern Iraq. And... Um, he told Jonah to go and tell Assyria to repent, tell Nineveh to repent, or he was going to destroy it because of his wickedness. Jonah didn't want to go because he kind of had a sense from God that the people might actually repent. And if they did, he wouldn't destroy it. God would withhold his judgment. But God didn't allow him to say no. Jonah famously got in the boat, went the other way, and... God sent a, a tremendous storm. The sailors were forced to, to throw Jonah overboard. A great fish swallowed him. True story, not figurative. And belched him out after three days onto the beach in the other direction, pointing him back to Nineveh. Jonah finally said, okay, fine, I'll go. He went, he preached, and Nineveh repented, which Jonah didn't want. Jonah hated Nineveh because of the crimes they had done against the Israelite people. The Ninevites, without going into graphic descriptions, did very bad things, harsh tortures and other things to people that they conquered. 
but they repented. And in the middle of this, Jonah is sitting back on a hill outside the city, and he's watching. He made himself a shelter, uh, watching the city to see if God's going to judge it or if they're going to repent. And in the middle of that, God grew up a plant to give him shade. Jonah was thankful for the plant, and then God sent a worm to destroy the plant, and the shade was taken away. Jonah got mad. And God, so in verse 9, Jonah 4, 9, God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And Jonah said, this is one of the funniest lines in the Bible for me. Said, Jonah said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. <laughs> but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow and which came up in a night and perished in a night. And yet, and should I not pity Nineveh that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. Livestock's reference to animals. This is not a reference to people in general. The phrase, someone who can't discern from the right from the left hand means a child. It means they haven't reached, in Hebrew, it means they haven't reached the age of accountability. God is saying, should I not pity Nineveh? Don't you know there's 120,000 children in there and many animals to boot? So God is understanding it. Well, he obviously understands, but he's trying to help Jonah understand. Look, if I judge Nineveh, I understand that you're mad about these villains, these adults who have done these things. But what about the innocent kids and the animals that haven't done anything? Because they would perish too in a Sodom and Gomorrah-like type judgment. So God is, uh, and we also see that mathematical formula coming into play in, when Abraham is uh, uh, negotiating with Jesus about uh, the angel of the Lord, which was an Old Testament appearance of Yeshua about the destruction of Sodom. And Abraham is going down in numbers and saying, if you find this many righteous people, will you not destroy it? So anyways, I just think it's uh, helpful to understand because sometimes when it comes to God's judgment, we wonder why he doesn't judge. And then when he does, we wonder why he did judge. And in both cases, we think God's wrong. You know, Right now, you look at the evil of the country, evil of the world, and we say, God, why are you not stopping this? But when he starts, when he actually intervenes and begins to stop it, then people start shaking their fists at him and say, why have you done this? Why have you judged? And in both cases, God is consistent in his character. He loves people, and he loves children, and he will protect but he is merciful and he is gracious. And when he delays judgment, it's because there are innocent children and animals that don't deserve it at a minimum. Not to mention the mercy and grace and love that he has for others that he's giving time. He's trying to give time for repentance, just as he gave the people of Nineveh a chance to repent. So did he give uh, so does he give us time. He gives people time to repent. There comes a moment when that time is past, and I believe we've passed that time as a country. But um, regardless, once he does start, he's also acting in love. He's protecting. He knows those children and animals will come straight to him. The only thing that will change is their location, and any suffering will be temporary, and he will heal it. The real question is about those adults who haven't repented. You know, those are the ones uh, that are really at risk. But he's only going to tolerate so much, and he loves kids. So let's pray for our country and do everything we can to protect and bless innocent children. See you soon.